Welcome students to the lesson of today. I will be taking you through information security and I'm from the School of Computing and Informatics Department of Information Technology. Uh, the topic for today is introduction to information security and I'll be taking you through four sections for today and one of them is uh, uh, the learning objective is to understand the basic concepts of information security which we'll cover in section one. In section two we will explore uh, vulnerability and threats to information. In section three we are going to learn mitigation measures to information threats and lastly in section four we will understand record security classification. Uh, we'll start with section one, which is definition of terms. Information security is protection of processed data from un uh, unauthorized access. A threat is a risk uh, which can potentially harm a computer system and organization, e.g. a virus. A vulnerability is a weakness which allows an attacker to reduce a system information assurance. Uh, information disclosure is the release of information that, 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 that is not is secure when it is released to untrusted environment. A backdoor is a method of bypassing a normal authentication, securing a remote access to a computer. Uh, why do we protect uh, uh, an information or a computing system? There are four major reasons as to that. And one of them is to prevent theft or damage to the hardware, uh, which is like the CPU, uh, your phone, and other devices. Secondly, is to protect the software components from intrusion. Every hardware is governed by the brain, uh, which is the operating system or the software, uh, which we have to protect from any intrusion. Uh, the next one is to prevent theft or damage of uh, information because any attacker to a system or any hacker his attempt to get into the system is to steal any information that is stored therein. And lastly is to prevent disruption of uh, service. Uh, having understood that, we need now to understand what are some of these threats uh, that we have to a computer system or to an information system. Uh, I'm going to go through uh, four of them to have a basic understanding. One of them uh, is a computer virus, which is a threat. And this attack alters a computer operation. A virus is simply a malicious program or code which is intended to alter any operations of a computer. And one of the mitigation measures is to use updated uh, viruses which we have uh, in the market. The other threat is spyware threats. A spyware is also a malicious uh, code uh, which monitors online activities or installs programs without user consent. Uh, another name for that we can say is like a Trojan which can be able to remotely monitor and know exactly what you're doing in your computer and probably steal passwords and other uh, essential information. Uh, one, some of the mitigation measures is one, installing trusted software, uh, making sure the sites that you're visiting to download softwares are genuine, and also using password encryption to make sure uh, your passwords are safe. Uh, the other uh, threat is what we call hackers and predators. Uh, an example is cyber terrorism, uh, whereby information can be able to be uh, retrieved from your emails, an attack can be able to be launched to your computer, and personal information can be used. And that one leads to what we call cyber bullying, like demanding information or doing something called like a ransomware, whereby you're being told to pay so that your computer uh, can be released uh, from uh, an attack. Uh, some of the mitigation measures is updating your operating system regularly so that the patches are updated. Uh, for example, recently, uh, like Windows or uh, upgraded from Windows 7 to Windows 10, so you need to be current in terms of uh, updating your operating system. And also avoiding questionable websites uh, anytime uh, you're visiting such. 
the other threat is uh, phishing, which is simply someone masquerading as the original uh, uh, person uh, or maybe like the real business, uh, but they are actually pretending to be. And one of the ways to mitigate that is to practice safe email protocol. Uh, what we are saying uh, simply is do not open an email which you don't know a trusted source and to an extent do not download attachment which you are not sure or aware of. Uh, moving on to the principles of uh, information security. Any information system is built on three principles. And this is what we call the uh, CIA triad because it is composed of confidentiality, which stands for the C, I, integrity of a system, and A, availability of the system. Uh, we start with confidentiality. Confidentiality of any information is is the data private or do we have privacy of the data is it intended or has it reached the intended recipient if that is compromised it leads to what we call disclosure of information integrity is all about ensuring data is tamper proof do we have trust between a sender a and a receiver b the moment that is compromised, then we say data has been altered and it's not in its original state. And lastly is availability. What we mean by availability is are resources available to the intended people throughout within a 24-7 reliability. And the moment when that is denied, that one leads to what we call DOS, denial of service. Allow me to uh, explain further. Uh, on the concept of the CIA trial, we'll start with confidentiality. Confidentiality simply means only the sender and the intended recipient should be able to assess the content of the message. If you are sender A and you have a receiver B, it means there is no man in the middle to intercept this information. And when a system achieves such a state, we mean uh, we are able to say it has achieved confidentiality. The next one is availability. Availability means that assets are accessible to the authorized parties at the appropriate time. So in this case, we are not just saying uh, the data is available, but you are saying it is available at the intended time. For example, if I make a request to a server and I want to log into my bank, am I able to get that service on the time or am I told that I'm out of service? And this is a good illustration whereby if the server is compromised using botnet and having denial of service attacks to a server, then at that point, the user who is requesting the service is not able to receive. And at this point, we can say we don't have availability in such a system. I may expound further on vulnerability so that we now may be able to understand uh, the concept of CIA trial. The moment any of this, the integrity, confidentiality is compromised, then that one we call it a threat, and every threat has a consequence. For example, if the integrity of the system uh, is compromised, then modification of user data happens, and also memories of messages and traffic are modified. And what is the consequence? It means there will be loss of information and compromise of the machine. Uh, confidentiality. Any moment uh, the confid confidentiality is compromised, then uh, there is if drop if dropping on the net, and then it leads to the theft of information uh, between the server client uh, infrastructure. That one leads to loss of information and privacy. Denial of service. Any time that happens as a uh, as a vulnerability then the threat is there is the killing of user thread and there is the flooding of the machine with bogus request. And the consequence of that is the genuine user is prevented from accessing or getting the work done. Authentication. Uh, under authentication, what happens when there is a threat is there is impersonation of the legitimate user and that one leads to the misinterpretation of user belief that uh, false information is valid. Moving on to section two, 
uh, we will expound more vulnerabilities and threats. A vulnerability is simply a loophole. It's a backdoor that is available for a threat to be able to assess an organization resources. And organization resources may include the hardware. It may also include the saved information. It may also include the databases or even to some extent uh, the money that is within the institution. When you talk about vulnerability areas, it may occur in four levels. And level one is what we call the user. When the user is compromised, some of the vulnerabilities we have is one, unauthorized access uh, to the system. Errors may also occur, which may also be caused by the user making the, the errors intentional or un unintentionally. Uh, viruses and spyware may also come in at the level of the client who is the user. Uh, the next level is the communication line. Within the communication line, we are talking about the internet or even the large area network within an organization. When this is compromised at the level of communication, the following happens, and these are some of the vulnerability. One of them is tapping, uh, sniffing, message alteration, and even to some extent, theft and uh, fraud. And in greater extent, even radiation may happen at this level, uh, making the system compromised. A level three is what we call the corporate server. Uh, and at the corporate servers, at this point, we experience hacking. Uh, we also have viruses and worms, which may also be planted within the corporate servers, and also theft and fraud, vandalism, and also denial of service happen at the level of corporate server. The last level is what we call the corporate systems. Uh, whereby we have the hardware operating system and databases where information is stored. And when a vulnerability occurs at this level, the following uh, things happen. There is the theft of data, copying of data, alteration of data, hardware failure, and also software failure. I will start with the user-related vulnerability. How does it happen? It starts from the human aspect, whereby using the software that are existing within the system, an attack can be launched. An attack can either be technical-based or human-based. Technical-based, we mean it can either be form of a software, like a virus. And when we talk about human-based, it may be motivated by an ill motive employee who wants to corrupt the system. The moment the attack happens, it may also come at the level of the network whereby the content is compromised, the privacy settings are also compromised, and the security settings are compromised. And that one means from the originating person right through the network, the receiver is able to receive a corrupted information. And at this point, for the attack to be effected completely, the receiver is targeted by the attacker based on uh, four areas. One of them is their behavior related. How well trained is the employee within the institution? There is also what we call perceptual related, uh, socio-psychological related, and socio-emotional related. Every time an attacker wants to do a social engineering attack, we'll maximize on these concepts so that to be able to penetrate within a system using a user who is an employee within the institution or even a third party for that case. We have uh, several classification in this case, four of them, of user threats that may arise within an institution. One of them is what we call malicious insiders. This is someone who is an employee or a partner who uses their legitimate access to the corporate data for, uh, for personal gain. This is someone who assesses the system or test the data simply for their personal gain. The other one is what we call insider agents. Uh, these are malicious in insiders who are recruited by external parties so as to steal, alter, or tamper with the data within the institution. We have also what we call the disgruntled employees. These are emotional attackers who seek to harm their own organization as a revenge uh, for some perceived wrong done to them. We also have what we call careless workers. These are employees or partners who neglect or ignore the rules of an organization and the cybersecurity policy which has been put in place. 
And lastly, we have third parties. These are vendors who misuse uh, their assets and compromise the security of the sensitive data. Examples may be people who are hired to develop softwares and even to do maintenance to an organization. Uh, we move on to the next level uh, of corporate to understand the threats that uh, happen at the corporate servers. Uh, this one demonstrates a user trying to assess a session uh, so as to gain access to a server. And when this happens and there's a man in the middle, this is an attacker trying to sniff a legitimate uh, session, then the following things are bound to happen. Hacking, uh, virus and worms, theft, uh, fraud, vandalism, and denial of service attacks. Within the communication lines, uh, the following vulnerabilities are, are bound to happen, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, but for us to understand much more better, I will classify them into two categories. We have the active threats, we have the passive threats. Under the active threats, we have interruption availability, modification or integrity, and fabrication of authenticity. In the second category, we have passive threats, whereby we have exposing confidential information and traffic analysis. In simple terms, under active threats is whereby information is altered, but under passive attack, no alteration happens only gaining access to information which is confidential. Moving on to section three, we need to understand, now that we have understood we have threats within a system, we have vulnerabilities, we have weaknesses within a system, how do we make sure that our information is protected? And simply to protect information, we need to understand the infrastructure which is able to carry on information. Right from the internet uh, to the outer firewall of an organization, which now protects the web server of an organization. Then in, we have the inner firewall, which protects the corporate system, like management information system, and also protect the databases, which are hosted within the corporate system. And finally, this one gives us access to the large area network, which is the LAN. And what mainly governs uh, the, the protection of the outer firewall and the inner wall are the policy loop which have been placed by the organization. To understand threats much more better, uh, there's an analysis done by Kaspersky Security in 2015, which is analyzes uh, the most common financial-based attacks analysis. And if you check within the list, the most prominent types of attacks is what we call Trojan SMS. And then we have the risk to uh, going down up to uh, hack tool and others uh, within an institution. So we need to understand these threats and then we are able to know the mitigation factors which we are able to come up with. What are some of the consequences of data breach? If a hacker is able to assess an institution, is able to assess Uh, consequences of data uh, breaches, if uh, an information uh, system is uh, compromised, the following things are about to happen. One of them is financial losses to an institution, ruined business uh, reputation. Uh, if, for example, a website is hacked and uh, terrorists are able to post their own materials, that one ruins the reputation of uh, a system uh, and even the business reputation. We also have regulatory fines. Uh, for example, if uh, a system is breached and information like credit card is stolen for members within a bank, uh, then lawsuits are able to arise out of that. We also have what we call uh, failing share prices. Immediately, an organization goes to the public. They have been attacked. Uh, the shareholding and the people who are interested loses interest, and that one means uh, falling in share prices. And also disclosure of trade secrets. Uh, the moment a business espionage is able to be performed and trade secrets are leaked out, then it means uh, you're running out of business. And also compromise of consumers' data, which is very key. Uh, and lastly, this one leads to loss of customer trust. 
and finally uh, you are out of business and that's why it's very uh, serious to consider uh, the consequences of data breaches which now leads us now to discuss what are some of the mitigation measures we have to ensure that we don't have compromise of computer uh, systems. Uh, one of the mitigation measures is to make sure there is continuous employee education. What we mean by this is creating a human firewall uh, because we saw there is an outer firewall and an inner firewall, but the most important is the human firewall whereby the people understand the policy of the institution and also they understand what they are supposed to do in case an attack is launched, how to secure their passwords and how to be sure they're operating in a safe environment. Uh, point number two is monitoring network traffic for suspicious activity. Uh, anytime there is an attack within a system, uh, the network admin uh, should be able to know uh, if an attack is being launched and able, be able to mitigate uh, a prevention measure. Uh, point number three is ensuring we have upgrade and patch software immediately and promptly. Uh, recently, uh, there was an attack a ransomware uh, which attacked most of the computers and later uh, it came to the knowledge of the public that most organizations that were atta uh, attacked were uh, not using up-to-date operating system uh, for their uh, uh, system. Uh, point number two, four is uh, to develop and implement real-time monitoring strategy and analysis of uh, log files and wire data. Uh, moving on, we also need to implement robust endpoint security uh, to protect your business from zero-day malware and uh, uh, user mistakes. What we mean by uh, malware is a class of uh, malicious programs, which also we may have adware. Uh, anytime you visit a website, you have pop-ups which are uh, adverts, and there's an attempt to click on them. So you need to implement a robust endpoint uh, security. Uh, point number six is to upgrade authentication inside and out, including mob mobility and uh, Internet of Things policies. So any institution uh, that wants to make sure they have proper mitigation measures must implement the right policies to make sure uh, their users, their data, and their hardware component is protected from any attack. Uh, point number seven is to harden external facing web applications. Uh, one of the major areas whereby most attacks happen is through the web uh, platform. And one of the best ways to do this is to ensure you have an SSL within your uh, organization that is secure socket layer. If you visit most of the commercial website, you realize they don't only have the HTTP, but they have HTTPS, the S standing for the SSL. Uh, point number eight is to know where sensitive data resides then develop data protection strategy to include encryption uh, monitoring. We'll understand this much more when we come to the classification of data so that you are able to implement a very secure uh, protection to the confidential and the highly confidential information of an institution. Uh, the last three is uh, implement legal application development testing and code reviews. Uh, Mostly when you talk about backdoor, uh, it is simply a loophole that was left within a system by the programmer. And as an institution, implementing this makes sure that the code and the software is safe and the hacker cannot find a backdoor uh, to be able to do uh, an entry to the system. Uh, point number 10 is to perf uh, perform annual penetration assessment and vulnerability assessment. Under this classification, we are talking of ethical hacking, whereby you can be able to hire an ethical hacker to come and assess uh, whether the system is penetratable, and this can be done annually or maybe periodically based on the policy of the institution. And lastly, but not the least under mitigation measures is uh, prepare for the worst case scenario and develop emergency incidents response plans. Uh, at the end of the day, an attack is about to happen to an organization. What is the strategy do you have? Under this we are talking, do you have a backup plan? Uh, do you have a redundant server which is somewhere uh, uh, which can be able to pick up from the last uh, uh, case of attack? 
And uh, with that, uh, it takes us now to section number four. We are talking of securing information, and you cannot secure what you don't understand. And so we are going to go uh, through four types of classification of information. One of them is public information. And the public information, we are talking of uh, uh, birth, uh, death records, marriage, and licensing. Uh, this information is readily available within the public domain and can be shared freely uh, with external parties for public uh, consumption, and this information has no visual markings. Uh, the, the second type of information is what we call general information. Uh, this is the information that can be shared through the organization for internal use, and also it doesn't have any visual markings. For example, is notices within an institution, uh, internal memos operating within an institution. The next two uh, types of classification which are, are very critical is one, we call it confidential. Confidential information can be shared on need to know basis. Uh, it has visual markings and also may include uh, uh, what we call a watermark, a header, and a footer to make sure that information is confidential. An example of that is bank details, uh, medical history or records, and personal care issues. Uh, which are shared on a need base. Uh, the last category, which is very key, is what we call highly confidential information. And this information is critical for the organization. Uh, it is only shared with the named recipient, the intended recipient, and cannot be printed or downloaded at any time. An example is social security numbers, credit card numbers, personal financial uh, information, of an institution among others. Now to secure this information, we need to understand seven phases uh, of seven uh, steps that are included in ensuring that we have attained information uh, security. Uh, and one of them, we start with phase one, whereby we do project deployment, uh, that is the data in use now and then. And uh, phase two is discovery. This is what we call data and at rest, which has already been processed and secured. Uh, so we start with one, complete risk assessment. How, uh, how risky is the data if it's assessed by a third party? That's what we are calling a risk assessment. Uh, is the data general or does it fall under the highly confidential information? When you understand that, you are able to know how you're going to classify that data uh, for uh, information security. Uh, step number two after doing a complete risk assessment is develop a formal classification policy. This one now we categorize the data into the four categories which we have mentioned. And within the third level, we now categorize the data types based on the policy which we have developed uh, within the policy document. And that one leads to point number four, whereby now we discover location of data. Where is data stored? And this is what we are saying. You must discover or be able to understand your most critical data within an organization so that you are able to know where it is hosted. After that, now we are able to identify and classify the data based on the location and also the categorization of the data. Uh, at this level is when we are able to enable security controls. What measures do we put? For example, for the highly confidential information, what are some of the watermarks? What are some of the security features we can put to it so that we make sure the data is secure? And far beyond that, if we need to encrypt data and store it, we proceed and uh, enact that at the level of security controls. And lastly, we are supposed to monitor and maintain that data. Remember, in the world of information security, threats are emerging now and then. What we had in the 19th century is not what we have in the 21st century, and in the near future is not what we are going to be having. So we need to keep on evaluating how secure is our data, how well encrypted is our data, how well is our classification policy, is it up to date uh, with the standards currently that we have in the market. And with that, we are able to make sure the data is secure. After classification and having uh, the process of uh, uh, classifying the data and securing the data, we need to do what we call security control for the records. For example, 
For all security for paper records, we can be able to have the following measures. One of them is locked storage areas, whereby the data is safe within cabinets. Uh, point number two, we can have fire and flood uh, protection so that uh, we use fire suppressors and climate control uh, systems. And lastly, we can have secure storage facility, which is simply an off-site storage, whereby we can be able to recover the data in case of a fire and such. Uh, the other control we can have now for the electronic uh, records is one, we can be able to do what we call document uh, redaction, that is obscure sensitive parts of new digital uh, documents, and two, we can also have access control list, that is ACL, and in this we limit access to sensitive files for only those who need that information, and finally we can be able to have file encryption where data is uh, encrypted and kept under a password for the right people and the only people who are intended to receive that information. A summary of what we have learned today, one is to define information security to understand uh, what it is. Uh, point number two uh, is to describe 10 vulnerability and threats to information uh, systems. And point number three is to discuss the various mitigation measures to information threats. And lastly, to describe the seven stages of record uh, security classification. Thank you so much. These televised lectures supplement our robust online learning going on on our MKU online platform. You can view more on our televised lectures via our online platform. We are in a digital era and Mount Kenya University knows this. The following are the steps to follow so as to complete your online application. Download the application form from the website www.mku.ac.ke. Attach copies of your academic certificates and ID. Pay the application fees via M-Pesa pay bill number 270988. Your ID is the account number. 2,000 shillings is the charge for a postgraduate. You can also deposit in the bank accounts provided on the website. Then, email all the above to apply at mku.ac.ke.